Welcome to another press conference. This one is on the 2017 wildfire season. And we'll have three panelists who will uh, give their presentations in a row. And at the end, we will open the floor for questions from the journalists in the room or from those watching remotely who can ask questions using the chat feature below the stream. Uh, taking part in this press conference, we have David Peterson, who is a researcher with the US Naval Research Laboratory in California in the US. Andrea Stoll, who is a senior scientist at NILO, the Norwegian Institute for Air Research, uh, and is at the Department of Atmospheric and Climate Research. Uh, then we have Antonio Ferreira, who is a researcher at the Polytechnic Institute of Coimbra in Portugal. And finally, we have Etienne Torreni, who is a researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in Spain. And I'll now hand over to our speakers. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dave Peterson. I'm a meteorologist at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory in Monterey, California. And I'm here to talk about uh, what we call wildfire-driven thunderstorms and some of the similarities between them and volcanic eruptions. As you can see from the slide, I, I'm part of a large research team, and we're very excited to bring this research to the EGU meeting this year. Um, I think you'll find this is a, we provide a unique perspective on uh, extreme wildfire behavior and how that affects the atmosphere. And NRL, the Naval Research Lab, has been a, a pioneer in this research since it began in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, so if we, if we consider wildfire-driven thunderstorms, the scientific name for these are pyrocumulonimbus. And in the community, you'll often hear them referred to uh, pyrocb as short. So if you take a look at that image, uh, it gives an example of a pyrocb. This was taken from aircraft. And What's going on here is there's a large and intense wildfire, and it's producing a lot of heat. And as that heat rises, it produces an updraft. And at certain times, it can produce a cloud at the top of that updraft. Now, some of our previous research has shown that under certain weather conditions, that cloud will continue developing into a full-blown uh, thunderstorm, as you see here. And in some ways, these are similar to traditional thunderstorms. They produce lightning. Um, they're very tall. But, and, and obviously, if you're trying to fight this fire, it, if this appears over the fire, it produces a lot of challenges for, for ground operations. But the difference here is that the fire is driven by, or the, the thunderstorm is driven by the fire heat. So most of the smoke being released by the fire goes directly into this cloud. And you end up with this very dirty uh, thunderstorm. It's, in fact, these are some of the dirtiest clouds on Earth. So, Essentially, this is a giant chimney taking smoke from the surface to high altitudes, at least to the altitude of aircraft, you know, cruising altitudes. The issue here, though, is there's currently no prediction for these events. So when they occur, a lot of smoke reaches high altitudes and is transported downstream, um, but there's no prediction for that. Uh, there are also situations where the smoke will get even higher, sometimes reaching into the lower stratosphere. Once you put smoke in the lower stratosphere, it sits there for a while, has a long residence time. Uh, so it brings up the big science question, well, what is the role of PyroCB in the climate system? All right, so with that in mind, we'll take a look at a specific event here. This is uh, August 2017, uh, the 12th of August to be specific, in the Western, Un Western North America. So we're looking at British Columbia, Canada, and Washington State in the United States. We're calling this event the Pacific Northwest event, but it's also been called the Mega PyroCB or the Mother of All PyroCB. It's the biggest event to date. So if we look, take a look at this animation here, this is a satellite loop looking down from space. Uh, the pink gives you an idea of where there were active wildfires. Uh, all summer long, this area experienced lots of wildfire activity and producing plenty of sources of heat. Uh, the white shading here is cloud cover. And then where you see the green, those are the actual fire-triggered thunderstorms uh, looking down from space. So we can distinguish them from traditional cloud cover because they are filled with smoke. And the Naval Research Lab has developed the first uh, systematic algorithm to detect these from satellite. So as you look at this five-hour loop, you'll see there were five total PyroCB. But in that big circle uh, over British Columbia, towards the end of the loop, you'll see there's four very large PyroCB anvils. And each one of these, as it gets to right about there, represents four direct pathways for smoke to reach the stratosphere. Okay, so it's those events that, that really drove this case. And if we fast forward a few days, 
the result was this smoke plume. So here we have an enormous smoke plume. It's uh, extending from the Canadian Arctic over Hudson Bay across eastern North America over the uh, northern Atlantic Ocean. And if you look really close, you'll see that that smoke is actually above the clouds. So the majority of this is in the stratosphere. And, and it's this here which has generated most of the, the uh, um, interest in the community, because normally when you see something like this, you think volcanic eruptions. Uh, that's what normally puts a lot of material into the stratosphere. But in this case, it's all coming from those wildfire-driven thunderstorms. So this is about three or four days after the event. It was eventually observed over Europe, over Asia, and then encircled the entire northern hemisphere. And it persisted, the signal of this smoke persisted in the, in the stratosphere for several months, just as you would see with the volcanic eruption. So our talk at this conference is, is targeted at, well, how does piracy be activity actually compare to volcanic eruptions. So we're going to jump directly to the punchline. So this is a, a quantitative figure of stratospheric uh, intrusions, or cases where material made it into the stratosphere. So that bottom axis is in a log scale. So the events uh, towards the right are, are many times more significant than the events on the left. It's kind of like a Richter scale for uh, uh, stratospheric impacts. And we'll start at the top. Oops. So that red bar at the top is the eruption of Mount Kazatochi in Alaska. That was back in uh, 2008. This was a pretty significant volcanic eruption. You can see it put in between 0.7 and 0.9 teragrams of stratospheric mass. Uh, below that is our event that I just showed you, the, the 2017 case. So it's slightly less. And in, uh, than the eruption of Kazatochi. But remember, Kazatochi was a powerful volcano. Not quite as powerful as, say, Mount Pinatubo, but it was known in the community to have a, a major um, effect on the stratosphere. So, you know, we're on the same order of magnitude. Anything between about 0.1 and 1 is definitely volcanic in scale, and this case fits in that range. Uh, below that, we have the 2013 fire season in western North America. So, in this case, there were 26 individual piracy CB occurring across Western North America in a three-month period. And you can see that this event from 2017 alone, just in one night, produced more mass than an entire uh, fire season, a bigger stratospheric impact. But we consider that that 2013 fire season was comprised of what we call more typical pyre CB. They still have a stratospheric impact, but it's many times less. And that's these cases here on the left. So by themselves, they're not comparable uh, to a volcanic eruption. But when you consider the cumulative effect over a fire season, that too starts to approach uh, volcanic territory. And then finally, in the middle, is the previous benchmark for an extreme pyre B event. This is what really started this research back in the early 2000s. You can see that's kind of in the middle, but yet the 2017 event also exceeded uh, that case. So we've been doing this research uh, to motivate additional study um, obviously, if we're in the territory of volcanic eruptions, there's potential imp climate implications here. And we will continue doing analysis um, of additional cases to see how piracy B actually affect the climate system. And uh, from there, I guess we can go to the next speaker. So, not yet, sorry. Yeah, but, okay. so I'm Andreas Stoll. I'm a senior scientist uh, at NILO in Norway, and I'm normally I'm studying long-range transport in the atmosphere, all sorts of uh, material uh, from radionuclides to forest fires. And uh, when I first heard about uh, fires in Greenland last year, we immediately decided in the group to to study this. Uh, as you can see, this is a paper given this afternoon, actually in a session. Uh, and it's a large group of people. Uh, so first author is also here in the room, Nik Nikos Evangelio. Uh, so what's uh, what's interesting about fires in in Greenland? Uh, well, if you if you consider that Greenland is uh, the largest uh, ice sheet uh, apart from Antarctica, and having fires very close to this ice sheet in it immediately it triggers uh, some thinking: what happens if this smoke falls down on on the ice sheet? 
so uh, this uh, kind of motivated us to actually look at uh, what impact had that event uh, or could events like this ha have on the on the Greenland ice sheet. So I'll, I'll start right away with the summary uh, and I'll show you some slides uh, after that. So first of all, in 2017, it was the first time that uh, large, relatively large uh, fires burned in, in Greenland. Uh, there were smaller fires before, but uh, nothing like, like this. Uh, the fires burned, uh, as you can imagine, there is no forest in Greenland, so they burned on permafrost, on frozen, on permafrost that melted. Uh, and it's peatlands, basically, so the peat was burning. Uh, uh, and uh, these fires, of course, uh, emit uh, all sorts of aerosols, uh, among them absorbing aerosols. And if these absorbing aerosols, soot particles, basically, if they fall down on the Greenland ice sheet, they have the capability, of course, of darkening the ice uh, surface. So that's kind of the main interest, because not many people are living there. Maybe air quality is not a, ma a major driver of interest, but uh, the cli potential climate impacts uh, certainly are. Uh, and what we found is actually that the, that the fires were actually very effective in terms of uh, causing uh, darkening of the Greenland ice sheet, but they were re still relatively small compared to fires burning somewhere else. So in the end, we found that actually it didn't have a major impact yet. Uh, but we can see it as a kind of a can, uh, of the miners' cannery uh, because that hasn't happened before, and there's potential, of course, for much larger fires. So they are very efficient in targeting the surface, but at the same time, they were not yet large enough. Uh, but what happens if, if larger fires should burn there in, in the future? Anyway, so now I, I'll show you uh, some slides. So these are photographs that were taken uh, by a pilot uh, flying close to the fires. So you can see it's not as large wildfires as you can uh, see in uh, burning in Canada, for instance, but they were quite substantial. So uh, you can also observe this from space. Uh, they started burning uh, on end of, end of July, 31st of July. You see the first kind of small plume and then within a few days everything explodes basically and uh, you see quite a substantial plume from, from the satellite uh, burning. Uh, and uh, you can also then look at, uh, at uh, maps where you can look at the burn scars, so you can see the area that has actually burned. Uh, and what you find out there is, if you, if you look at the land use there, it's peatlands, it's, uh, it's frozen peatlands. Uh, and uh, actually these peatlands, uh, there is papers uh, exactly for that area where the forecast was that, you are, that these peatlands are in danger. And, uh, by the end of this century, it was kind of forecast that it might be vulnerable to melting. Well, it's not yet the end of the century, but uh, obviously they have melted enough already uh, last year uh, in order to trigger these fires or allow these facilitate these fires. Uh, so we, from, from these burn scars, we can estimate the area. So it was about 2,300 hectares. So nothing compared to Canadian fires, of course, but, uh, but still quite substantial. And uh, the, uh, this graph uh, on the bottom, uh, shows uh, hotspot detections, so satellite detections of fires, and it's just showing the number of these detections as a function of time from, from 2002 to 2017. And you can see that uh, sometimes uh, these hotspots are detected in, in, in Greenland. Uh, it could also be wrong detections, uh, which happen sometimes. It could also be that somebody burned something and it was detected by satellite, whatever. Uh, but what you can really see is that in 2017, it really stands out. So a large number of uh, fires were detected, uh, basically all related to this, this one fire event. So what we did is we, we took these uh, burn scars and tried to figure out uh, day by day how, how much, uh, how large the area was that was burned, and then estimated the, the fuel consumption. Uh, of course, it's a bit wild guesses uh, because we don't know exactly how much uh, of the peat has actually burned, how deep the fire went into the peat. Um, and then, uh, based on these fuel consumptions, we tried to estimate uh, the black carbon, the soot emissions, uh, this darkening component. Uh, and uh, so we did this uh, daily. And then uh, what we did is we put this into, uh, into a, a, a transport model and tried to estimate how much of that soot was actually deposited on, on the Greenland ice sheet. So the, just have a look at the, at the, at the figure in the, in the left uh, corner, uh, which shows the transport simulation. It shows where the plume, the fire plume was actually going. And uh, as you can see, uh, very often it was pushed away from Greenland, which is due to catapetic winds coming down from the ice sheet. Uh, 
But then the synoptic uh, circulation very often pushed the fires back uh, towards Greenland because we are in the westerly, so it's kind of pushed back towards Greenland. Uh, and uh, very often they traveled uh, across the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, on the bottom, you can see the deposition of black carbon. Uh, and, and you can see it's quite substantial uh, over, the, over the Greenland ice sheet. So a large fraction, actually, of the black carbon was deposited on the ice. And uh, if we know also the, uh, the snowfall that has occurred during that period, uh, about three weeks, so the fires burned about from the 31st of July around till the 20th of, uh, of August. Uh, you can also estimate the snow concentration uh, based on, uh, on, uh, on these simulations and uh, information on, on, on snowfall. Uh, and you can see where uh, in Greenland the snow was contaminated, uh, basically this, this left graph uh, with, uh, with black carbon uh, from the fires. Um, there is not a lot of validation da data. We are, of course, interested in how right, these are model calculations, how, how right are our model calculations or how wrong. It's not easy because there is no measurement data, there's no stations, a few people living there. Uh, but we were lucky at least with one satellite overpass, a LiDAR that flew uh, on a satellite that kind of uh, passed over the, the plume. Uh, so this is uh, this red line. Uh, and this is the simulated uh, plume at the, at the time of the, of the satellite overpass on 14th of August. And uh, this is what the satellite delivers. It's a lot of information there. It's most, of, most of these structures are clouds. And we just focus on a tiny uh, kind of uh, bit as the satellite flew over here. And this is uh, the smoke plume uh, that you can see uh, from, from the Greenland fires. Uh, and uh, we compared this with our model calculations. And at least uh, we can show that in this case, at least, we got the altitude right, which is important uh, because we, we, we want to know how high the, the, the plume went and how much was deposited then on the Greenland ice sheet. So we were not too wrong, at least uh, qualitatively, in terms of the, of the model simulation. Uh, and then we did uh, calculations uh, of what the changes uh, in terms of albedo uh, were due to the uh, deposition of this black carbon. Uh, and uh, while well, the albedo reduction you can see here, it's very small numbers, I can tell you. The efficiency is very, so per unit mass, uh, kind of the per mass emitted, uh, it was very effective, but the fires were still, let's say, a factor 100 or even 1,000 smaller than uh, what's burning in Canada very often. So even though they were very effective, uh, the de deposited mass, fortunately, was not uh, so large to really have a substantial impact on the albedo, on the re reflectance of the, of the green and ice sheet. And so the, also the, the effect on the radiative forcing was still relatively small. Uh, but still, I think it's kind of a warning signal that something like this uh, can happen on, on permafrost that was expected to be melting towards the end of the century, maybe. It has already melted last year, obviously. So this is kind of a warning signal and brings me back to the, to the summary slide again. Uh, if larger fires should burn, if, if the fires are, let's say, a factor of 10 to 20 larger than what we have seen here, uh, they would actually have a substantial impact on the albedo and probably uh, enhance uh, melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Antonio Ferreira. I'm the um, scientific coordinator of a research center uh, devoted to forestry, agriculture, uh, environmental and, and sustainability in the central region of Portugal. And um, I would like to show you a little bit, um, you know, the central region of Portugal is basically between this parallel and uh, this area, so th all the area around Coimbra, from the sea to the to the frontier with Spain, is the central region of Portugal. And this region is a very uh, specific region. It's a very diverse region. It's in the transition between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean types of climate, and. Uh, um, the setup of the region is uh, enhances this diversity. So we knew it's probably the only region in Europe and probably in the world where you can get from a, a, Scandinavia, a Scandinavian kind of uh, land use, and 80 kilometers afterwards you are in a land, uh, 
a land use type which which resembles the the African savanna, and this in 80 kilometers with uh, by road and in a non-linear um, in a non-linear way. So that sets you. Uh, we always knew that we had a very big problems because we are in the transition between two systems and basically we are very um, prone to to or very vulnerable to climatic change but this last year we discovered to what extent we are really um, vulnerable vulnerable so for instance this last uh, uh, photo was taken under uh, uh, in a situation that was a pyrocumulonimbus and some about 48 people died in that road in al about half a, a kilometer so this sets the the problem as you can see um, this is a fairly new um, problem before the the 70s we didn't have a, a problem with the forest fires uh, the, this problem has to do more with the changes in uh, land use, changes in the socio-economical um, uh, structure than uh, with climate. But uh, even so, you can see that uh, in some years, the, the bad years, we, we have more than 50% of the burnt area of the Mediterranean Europe, uh, which is a bit of a problem. And... Um, Last year we had uh, two two problems or two major events. The, we have the we have the pyrocumulonimbus, and then uh, as the season was ending, we had um, uh, the perfect storm basically, uh, where a cyclone was approaching. We were hoping that it would come inland and finish the the season uh, with some rain, but no, it didn't. Uh, came into land, it passed by and produced very strong winds. So basically, this is to show you the what happened. Uh, as you can see, this region, the central region of Portugal, is really vulnerable. That's the, the, the fire, the burnt areas in 19, in, in 2017, sorry. And uh, uh, I could, I, sh I would like to to pinpoint just three cases, the, the Pedragon Grande, uh, that's the Pyrocumulonimbus with 65 dead people. The Masson area, because the Masson was the, the, <laughs> the, the study case where forest is well um, kept and even so it burned. And then in two days, we have at the, the middle of uh, October, we had 47 deaths uh, due to the passing by of this hurricane, uh, due to many other uh, reasons. So we can discuss it after if you want. And the, the, the striking thing is we had two, something like uh, 200,000 hectares burned in two days. If they were burned in the entire season, that would have been uh, very bad here. And we had it in two days. This was the closest, uh, the closest thing or the closest image that I we I can remember is that's hell as it, it was talked in Sunday school. So we have some problems with this. One of the problems is we are actually turning into desert uh, areas um, uh, where it rains quite a lot. So the soils are being lost and um, our productive capacity is being lost. Um, and uh, because I'm the coordinator of the, this research center, I have to think on um, what to do to reverse this. And uh, basically we have to diverse, um, to diverse the, uh, the landscape, uh, mainly the, the type of forests and the type of uh, land uses that we have. And uh, one key part on this is to increase the, the carbon storage. Um, we have to increase diversity. Uh, one of the, we shouldn't uh, forget that uh, 
the landscape is also has an economical value and uh, that we have to change the, the, the economic systems within the landscape so that people can have a, an income from there. One of the main problems is that people just remove themselves. That's why we didn't have any fires before 1970. People just got, got out of these areas and... Um, sorry. Um, so we have to find other ways of uh, using it. For instance, uh, reinstalling grazing, uh, uh, having chestnut trees and so on. Um, we have to increase the income of people living there. Um, and this can be achieved by uh, adding value to the, the, to the products they produce because they are, uh, um, well, so basically, in conclusion, uh, we know that uh, we are, you know, one of the worst part, uh, one of the worst regions to be on in this context of climatic change. We knew that that before, but we never expected this this level of impact. Um, so the. Climatic changes. I see the fire as a, a process of changing, of change. It's a catalyzer. If the systems are not uh, in harmony with the climate, then we have fire and it will burn down and we have to start again. Sorry, uh, I'm overpassing the time. So we have the. Um, we have the problem of increasing areas and increasing burn uh, and the number of fires. Uh, uh, we have to increase the the diversity um, and uh, the, to build the, the to build the conditions to support new systems, um, and that's it basically. It's this in PDF? Yeah, yeah, PDF. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I can do it on a slideshow. Well, it's down there, full screen. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So, hello, my name is Etienne Tohini, and um, I'm working in the Climate Prediction Group of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And this is part of a, a project I'm working on uh, for seasonal prediction of wildfire risk um, in many areas. So also in Portugal, we'll be looking at uh, those areas in the future. Um, and I'm going to talk today about the um, extreme wildfire events of California in 2017 and trying to understand what are the uh, relative importance of climate and also the weather conditions that happened during the, that period. This is very recent research because the events happened in October and December. So it's uh, still ongoing. Um, so just an introduction, these are pictures I think of the LA area when um, there were very strong fires in uh, December and these caught a lot of media, media attention. The whole entire season was the cost list on record with um, 18 billion US dollars in damages and counting and also the dead list with uh, 43 ca uh, casualties uh, that had been recorded. So in October around the Napa Valley in Northern California, the Tubbs fire was the most destructive in um, in U.S. history in terms of uh, damages, and uh, it was attributed to warm temperatures and strong winds. Um, and, f and later on in December, Southern, Southern California uh, experienced very large fires, including the Thomas Fire, which was the largest in California, California history. And it was also thought to be uh, fueled by very strong Santa Ana winds and warmer than average uh, temperatures. The questions um, of the study are what are the relative importance of climate, for, uh, which are drought and heat waves, versus weather events such as uh, short-term dry spells and these strong winds. Um, and to do so, we use the Canadian Fire Weather Index, uh, which we use basically um, daily observations of temperature, precipitation, wind speed, and relative humidity. And um, so we want to see in which way the conditions of 2017 could contribute to these, uh, to, to these extreme fires and if there's any influence of human-caused climate change. 
So just to show you that the 2017 was extreme, on the left you have observed burned area from the MODIS satellite. Um, this is for a 17-year period. Um, and here is the uh, observed burned area during the 2017 uh, entire fire season. So much larger than average. And especially here in the south, it's basically the only event where there were fires observed in that area. So some areas, including here, over 80% of the area were burned. Um, and um, I have a few figures here, but I'll just try to walk you through really quick. So these are, this is the computing fire weather index, um, and it's a time series throughout the years. And basically the average in December here shows that it was the, the year with the highest fire weather index uh, in history. And well, in, in the observational period, and here we compute the number of days where the fire weather index was above the 90th percentile, which means how many days were very, very extreme. And here we have 80% of the days during the month of December were of the highest on record. Um, and we also, um, so one of the, um, the input of this fire weather index is uh, maximum temperature. And so we've seen that uh, maximum temperature here in 2017 was also higher than average, and about 40% of the days were considered extreme. And what we detected was a, um, a small trend in this temperature, uh, which is about 0 0.05 degrees Celsius per year. That may not seem much, but in a century that would be 5 degrees. So if you would say for this observation period, it's a trend of 1 degree Celsius. So part of this extreme event could be attributed to climate change. But um, also, we can't say that it's exclusively attributed to climate change because the, the anomaly that we, we uh, encountered was about 5 degrees Celsius during, the, during that, uh, the month of December. So we cannot say that it was exclusively due to climate change. And um, so to try to find out if the wind was responsible for this, so we have the same kind of plots here where I have um, average of wind speed. And actually, during this year, it was actually lower than on average. And here are the um, number of events above the 90th percentile for 2017 that was also lower. So we conclude that these events, uh, they could have been fueled by the wind, but the wind itself isn't responsible for having so much, um, so much fire during the season. Um, and uh, just to show a more um, spatial map of, uh, of, the, of the whole um, of, of the California, it is in this, it's in December of, uh, yeah, the month of December. So again, here we see the burned area anomaly, about um, yeah, more than um, more than 10, 20 percent. So actually, this here is above the chart, so something like 80 percent. And the fire weather index, which normally has low values in December because it's a cold season, had very strong anomalies, about uh, 20 on a, on a scale of 60. Um, and when you look at the wind speed, um, the, we did not see any considerable anomalies in wind speed in the, whole, in the whole area. Now, if we look at temperature, uh, normally temperatures in this area are about, maximum temperature is about 20 degrees. And as I said, we see anom anomalies about three or four degrees in the, in the monthly means. Uh, relative humidity was also lower than on, much lower than on average. And normally this area uh, has a, experiences a lot of rain in December, and there was basically no rain whatsoever at all. So we conclude that temperature and precipitation were the uh, key factors in creating these conditions. So uh, in conclusion, um, although the Santa Ana winds were important for spreading the fire um, as they fueled the flames, these winds are present uh, in, this, in this period every year, but they were not stronger, no more frequent than other years. Therefore, we cannot say that um, stronger winds have, have made this event more extreme. Uh, what we did see is that the anomalous warm and dry conditions, which persisted for months, that I haven't shown, but for various months it was very dry and very, uh, and, 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 and very warm, these created the extreme conditions which allowed the fires to, uh, to be so intense. We detected a trend in temperature and uh, we, need to, um, to, um, uh, we need more work to quantify its relative importance. Uh, would this event have been possible with or without climate change? It's, it's, it's hard to say. What we can say is that um, th there is a high chance that they, these kind of events will be more present uh, and more frequent in the future, especially if we see, um, if we see temperatures increasing uh, as they have, and if they, especially if they uh, accelerate. And so future work, um, we will be using the same kind of approach, but for doing seasonal prediction of fire risk uh, by predicting the number of days where the fire weather index um, increases, um, 
is above a certain threshold or above a certain percentile. And this uh, can hopefully make authorities um, aware of extreme conditions uh, to come. Um, for example, in, in Portugal, I'm, I'm sure they were well prepared, but in Galicia, in the same events, um, they were not prepared. And they probably did not have any climatic information that the conditions would be very dry in October. And so perhaps that's what contributed to so many, so much damage in that area. And so if you combine these seasonal forecasts to reliable short-term forecasts, so if you're prepared and you know that you have these extreme events coming in the next, in the next few days, then yeah, if you combine those two kind of forecasts, you could uh, prevent loss of property and life, such as the, those events that happened in California and in Portugal. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. We'll now open the floor for questions. Are there any questions from here in the room or from the stream? Uh, David, uh, a couple of questions. What's the difference between when does it get to be an extreme sort of pyro CB? So you had the chart that showed like the silver wildfire in New Mexico and then the Pacific Northwest fires last summer all the way up to the right on that graph. Is it just the size of the fire, the acreage, or is it also a combination of atmospheric conditions? Uh, so in this case, it's it's mainly the atmospheric conditions. Okay. So all of those events put smoke into the stratosphere. It's just in the case of this event from this past summer in British Columbia, all of the atmospheric conditions were perfect. There were lots of intense fires, so you were able to generate four at the same time with ideal conditions, and that allowed the smoke plume to get a lot higher uh, than in some of the other cases. Thanks. Is uh, follow up? Is there is there long term tracking of what? Ultimately, how does it disperse? Where does it all end up? When is it no longer detectable in the atmosphere? Or okay, so these pyrocy will put smoke into the stratosphere, and it'll sit there for an extended period of time. Um, there, there are a number of processes that can affect whether that goes higher into the stratosphere or if it gets removed. Um, you know, there are instances where meteorology will allow that smoke to be removed from the stratosphere. But in the case of the 2017 event, it persisted. If this occurred in August, it was still very noticeable in November and even in December. So we're talking several months. And then over time, it'll just slowly work its way out. And, and spread across the northern hemisphere? Right. So okay. that event spread the entire northern hemisphere. Okay. I have a, actually have a slide in my talk later today that shows that. Oh yeah, I was just going to say, do you think we're going to get more of these um, as a result of climate change? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, I can say that for as long as there have been wildfires, there have likely been pyro CB. Um, it's just a, f a function of having enough fuel to burn, a hot enough fire, and the right meteorology over that fire at the time. So. A function, whether or not we're going to have more is, is just simply a result of changing weather conditions. If the weather conditions become more favorable, there will be more pyro CB. Uh, but the issue is right now is that this is our data set. So we have one big case from 2017, and we have an inventory of fires from 2013, and that's it. So we don't even know right now enough about how they vary year by year to make any claim as to how they're changing currently or in the future. There's, there's quite a bit of work to be done. Are there any additional questions? Uh, Mr. Ferreira, um, has there been a short-term response to trying to make things more safe for the next year or so? Is there new wildfire mapping, emergency forest treatments, uh, clearing forests from around roads and communities? Has there been a, a good response in that sense? Yeah, yeah. So the, that has been set. Uh, you know, the, there's a, a contingency plan. Uh, the areas around uh, the villages and uh, and um, uh, along the, the the roads were compulsively uh, cleaned this year. Uh, I, there are some uh, voices that say that that's not uh, economically sustainable uh, if we will do this uh, every year. But uh, and there are some other uh, quite recent um, 
quite recent uh, measures. For instance, one of the things is to for the, the small villages that are uh, uh, in the fire region, uh, uh, the, there will be generators because one of the main things is when you have a big fire, the first thing that goes out is the electricity and without electricity you don't uh, have the power to to throw water. For to, so that's also s that is going to be uh, implemented this year and uh, there, are, there are a few. But, but on the other hand, we have to think the territory in a long scale and we have to re reintroduce some uh, autochthonous species which are more um, more resistant to, to fire and create a bigger diversity. If not, uh, you know, the fire will start from one hand and, uh, and... Are there any additional questions? Uh, if not, you are welcome to... Are you with Um, we will finish here. You are welcome to approach our speakers. There are four interview rooms available on the side. And our next press conference is at 2 o'clock, and it's on hazards on the wake of, act of climate change. So I hope to see you there. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for your contributions. <laughs>